Welcome to this uh, uh, edition of uh, IDM. I'm pleased to open this edition of the International Migration Dialogue, inspired and uh, informed to, on discussions in the run-up to the International Migration Review Forum, taking place in May. I assume uh, that, uh, as it is at IOM, the IMRF will be a central topic of discussion in your workplaces, households, and daydreams for the next few months. It is thus a particular pleasure this morning to welcome with us the President of the General Assembly to hear his thoughts and expectations for the IMRF, as well as the permanent representatives of Bangladesh, one of the two co-facilitators for the intergovernmental uh, um, consultations leading to the IMRF uh, Progress uh, Declaration. I would also like uh, to welcome the Ambassador of uh, Costa Rica to the United Nations here in Geneva and Chair of IOM uh, Council. Colleagues, the International Migration Review Forum presents a unique and important opportunity to reflect on the progress towards the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. It is not just a moment for states to come together. Migrant associations, civil society, private sector, trade unions and other stakeholders will have the opportunity to join a stakeholder consultation immediately preceding the IMRF, and then participate in all aspects of the forum itself. But we also have the opportunity to set out some issues and concerns over the next three days. Some timely, some urgent, but also matters, which risk being left behind in both domestic and uh, multilateral discussions. And there are many to discuss. Since the adoption of the Global Compact in 2018, progress has indeed been made, but much has also changed in the world. First, we must continue to explore the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic for migrants and ensure that people on the move are not left behind as the world seeks to overcome the pandemic and recover. We have an urgent need to work together across borders, across economies, and across sectors to enhance the predictability and the certainty of cross-border mobility while fully integrating public health and protection concerns and build capacity to manage admission and stay safely and equitably. At the IOM Council in December, I heard the call from many of governments during the I-level segment that we should address the reestablishment of coordinated and predictable global mobility and continue to support those migrants halted in transit or stranded as a result of the measures taken to deal with the pandemic. The future of mobility cannot become precarious or the preserve of the few. We must work to ensure that it is equitable for all. That is what is required to relaunch the world economy. And we must continue to include migrants in all aspects of the pandemic recovery itself. IOM's existing data and research suggests that migrants quickly become one of the hardest hit groups during an economic uh, downturn, particularly women and young people, and are more likely to become unemployed or find precarious work, which does not guarantee sufficient income. During times of increasing economic pressure, Discrimination towards migrants may also become more prevalent. The economic impacts of the pandemic have already been felt by many migrants, 
with overseas working re workers returning in large numbers to their home countries, while others choose to undertake dangerous, irregular journeys to find work. Recovery efforts will need to be fully inclusive, including vaccine distribution and programming, providing migrants with access to basic services from health to education. These actions become particularly important if we are to recoup lost ground in the pursuit of the Sustainable Development Goals. But we must also deliver on the opportunities of migration as well as the challenges. IOM is exploring the different ways in which the pandemic has shifted patterns of movement and the interlinkages with other sectors from employment to cross-border trade. We must also re-examine systems for skilled migration to fill persistent labor shortages, even despite the pandemic. Once empowered, I believe that migrants can and do make significant contributions to their communities, whether host or at home, and become a vector for sustainable development. IOM will continue to explore the various impacts that the pandemic has had on patterns of mobility, signal concerns, flag opportunities to work together, and adapt our programming accordingly. Some issues remain tragically persistent. More than 45,000 people, 45,000 people have died during migration journeys worldwide since 2014. The IMRF is also an opportunity to discuss the effective provision of life-saving humanitarian assistance for these victims, uh, all those in situations of vulnerability, as we shall explore in our session later today. We must also address the bottlenecks related to combating the crimes of smuggling and trafficking, search and rescue operations, and related capacity development initiatives. We must prevent as well as protect. We must also prepare for the future. The adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation are profoundly reshaping contemporary migration patterns worldwide in different ways. IOM does not only provide humanitarian response, but is also supporting communities, including indigenous communities, local and national governments, to better prepare and adapt to both slow onset processes and disasters. Our efforts to avert and minimize displacement induced by these climate hazards is aligned with the global compact objectives. As we look towards COP27, working in the UN system and with other bilateral and regional partners to ensure that human mobility induced by climate change is fully accounted for and addressed in global negotiations, we have an opportunity to prepare the groundwork for that discussion during the IMRF. Finally, we must address the fundamentals. Every person has the right to be recognized as a person before the law, as a human being, and to enjoy their human rights without discrimination. While the right to a legal identity is universally re recognized, access to proof of legal identity remains a challenge in several regions across the globe, as noted by the Secretary General's report on the implementation of the Global Compact launched the, the week before the last. Ladies and gentlemen, this IDM discussion, and indeed the IMRF itself, constitutes an important stop along the way to the long-term goal of realizing the 23 objectives of the Global Compact, benefiting from its 360 degree view. Our commitments are not periodic, but they are continuous. In this regard, the network is driving a pledging initiative in the lead up to the IMRF allowing member states to pledge actionable commitments to further the implementation of the GCM.
The Secretary General's report on the GCM offers balanced recommendations focusing on inclusivity, strengthening regular pathways, greater efforts to save lives and track missing migrants, and last but not least, capacity building. These can form, I believe, a good basis for member states to develop more concrete pledges, as well as our discussions here today. We are delighted to have already received confirmation that most member states will be represented at at least ministerial level with several contemplating head of state representation. I strongly encourage all of you to engage at the highest level at the IMRF, not just on the issues I've highlighted, but on all 23 objectives integrating to the compact's guiding principles, sending a strong signal of committed multilateralism on international migration. I look forward to our discussions ahead this week and in the coming months. It is your commitment and your ambition that will drive success in May, setting a tone of consolidation, ambition, and cooperation. Thank you. And after these opening remarks, uh, I am delighted to welcome His Excellency Abdullah uh, Shahid, the president of the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly, and uh, invite the president his keynote uh, remarks. Please. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I thank you for inviting me to participate in this timely event to help prepare for and set the tone for the first International Migration Review Forum. It will take place from 17 to 20th May, 2022, under the auspicious of the UN General Assembly. As anticipated in the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, during this dialogue, we will exchange views and reflect on our success and failures in implementing its provisions. By doing so, we will also fulfill our responsibility outlined in the modalities resolution of the forum. This resolution invites the international dialogue for migration to, and I quote, contribute to the International Migration Review Forum by providing relevant data, evidence, best practices, innovative approaches, and recommendations as they relate to the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Throughout our conversation, let us recall that the adoption of the Compact was a historic opportunity to shape a new global framework for migration. That choice stemmed for our common conviction that through the international cooperation, we can manage global migration in a manner that is effective, just human and beneficial to migrant communities and host countries alike. To that end, we have made commendable strides in the past three years, despite the challenges of COVID-19. Yet our successes remain fragile and we must solidify and build upon them. Much work remains to be done and our concerted action is needed. The tasks before us are plenty. Addressing unregulated migration, building inclusive societies, rescuing lives and protecting the most vulnerable, and expecting expanding social protections to cover migrants, including by providing them access to healthcare and vaccination, just to name a few. As we prepare to engage on these topics, I acknowledge and applaud that this international migration dialogue is aligned with the priorities set by the United Nations Secretary General in his report on the progress on the implementation of the Global Compact. I will be eager to receive the outcomes of this dialogue. Dear colleagues, migration is a key feature of a more interconnected world. Despite significant concerns about its economic and social implications, the movement of people across the world's borders boosts global productivity. It's often been seen that the countries that prioritize integration stand to make the most of this potential, 
improving outcomes for their own economies and societies, as well as for immigrants themselves. Today, we will discuss some of the most pressing issues pertinent to migrants and migration, including combating the rapid growth of migrant smuggling and human trafficking networks, the new challenges in addressing inclusion, and the positive role of remittances in alleviating financial burdens. I urge the participants to build on this dialogue and to use the intervening time between now and the IMRF to listen and prepare. Through robust communication policies, we must set a positive narrative and combat the increasing stigmatization, racism and xenophobia that increase in numbers of migrants endure. We must urge countries to move beyond words and implement comprehensive, effective and humane migrant policies in practice. These policies must be aligned with our broad, broader vision of facilitating planned, safe and regular pathways for migration while offering protection to those who need it. We must call on policymakers to recognize and value the role migrants play in these countries. They are entitled to compensation for their work, to protection without discrimination, and to key social services in countries of origin and destination. And we must call on states and stakeholders to act with trust and solidarity to implement migration policies that are aligned with the global compact as part of our efforts to recover better, meet the sustainable development goals, and usher in a brighter, safer future for everyone. I thank you and wish you all a very productive discussion. I want to reiterate my thanks to His Excellency, the President of the General Assembly, for having addressed this IDM. And now I want to welcome uh, Her Excellency Rabab Fatima, Ambassador, Permanent Representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations, and uh, one of the co-facilitators of the IMRF Progress Declaration. A big task, Madam Ambassador. <laughs> you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General Vittorino. That's indeed a big task. Um, thank you. Uh, President of the General Assembly, Director General Antonio Vittorino, Chair of IMM Council, Ambassador Catalina Aguilar, Excellencies, distinguished delegates. I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of Ambassador Olivia Maes, Permanent Representative of Luxembourg to the United Nations, and on my own behalf in our role as co-facilitators to conduct the consultations on the Progress Declaration to be adopted at the first International Migration Review Forum in May this year. We thank the President of the General Assembly for reposing his trust in us to undertake this important responsibility. We are committed to leading open, transparent, and inclusive intergovernmental consultations to agree on an evidence-based and action-oriented progress declaration as mandated by the UN General Assembly Resolution 73 slash 326. We thank you, Mr. Director General, for inviting us to address the opening session of the first International Dialogue on Migration, session of 2022, and to share our views and plans with you. The theme of this IDM, Global Compact for Migration Implementation in Practice, Successes, Challenges, and Innovative Approaches is very timely. We appreciate its dedicated focus on the first International Migration Review Forum. This will be helpful not only to identify the priorities of all stakeholders for the progress declaration, but also to have deeper understanding on the way forward to reach a common ground. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, since its adoption in December 2018, Member states have achieved significant progress in implementing the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Earlier this month, the Secretary General, in presenting his report to the UN General Assembly, highlighted concrete steps that countries have taken to make migration more safe, more orderly and more regular. Yet, he also put the spotlight on the challenges ahead of us 
which have often been exacerbated by the impacts by the COVID-19 pandemic. Against this backdrop, the first IMRF offers a timely opportunity to demonstrate international solidarity and partnership to overcome these challenges. We wish to seize the opportunity of this migration dialogue to ensure the right tone and level of ambition in the progress declaration. Allow us to share a few specific thoughts in this regard. Firstly, we wish to table a zero draft by mid-March. Prior to that, we will convene a virtual informal briefing on the 3rd of March for member states and have a town hall briefing on the 7th of this month for other stakeholders. We have already circulate, circulated the concept note and some guiding questions to facilitate fruitful discussions at those two meetings. We are also working with the Network on Migration to launch an online discussion space for the progress declaration that will provide stakeholders with the opportunity to submit written comments and remain engaged with us throughout the process. Secondly, the zero draft will be informed by the Secretary General's report, the reg regional reviews undertaken, the migration dialogue series hosted by the Network on Migration, the discussions at this session of the IBM, as well as broad consultations with member states and other relevant stakeholders. Thirdly, in terms of the focus of the declaration, we wish to highlight not only on the overall evaluation of progress in implementing the Global Compact and its 23 objectives, but also the GCM's 360 degree approach and the guiding principles. We shall seek to include lessons from our responses to the COVID-19 pandemic for strengthening international cooperation. And we aim to reinforce the linkages between the Global Compact and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Fourthly, the Secretary General's report identified four priority areas that member states may wish to focus on to achieve future progress, namely inclusivity, strengthening regular pathways, doing more to save lives and track missing migrants and reinforcing capacity building. We envisage a forward-looking document to guide action in areas that require further progress during the next four years. We would encourage member states and other stakeholders to guide us with specific ideas and inputs to strengthen our collective action to achieve the Global Compact's commitments. Finally, we recognize and appreciate the important role of the UN Network on Migration and that of the Director General of IUM as its coordinator to advance our collective efforts in the compact's implementation. We hope that the first IMRF will lead to strong pledges to advance the implementation of the GCM. Let me conclude by reiterating that Ambassador Olivia Maes and I look forward to steering an open, transparent, inclusive, and participatory process. We will soon share with you a concrete roadmap to guide the consultations in the coming weeks. It will be important, distinguished delegates, excellencies, important for all stakeholders to engage constructively, to identify the key priority areas, to bridge gaps, and to forge consensus. And we will count on your constructive engagement and collaboration for a meaningful and consensual outcome. I thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Co-Facilitator, and I, I wish you all the luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now I will turn to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Catalina de Vandas, who is uh, the permanent representative of uh, Costa Rica here in Geneva and chair of uh, IOM uh, Council. Madam Ambassador, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, señor director general. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, President uh, and Secretary General, and Robert Patima, permanent representative of, for Bangladesh and co facilitator of the progress declaration of the IMRF, and STEAM colleagues. We start this first international dialogue on migration of this year in a very complex context with a conflict in in the middle of Europe that has already forced more than 400,000 people to be displaced. 
this very serious humanitarian crisis requires once more a solid response from the international community in order to guarantee the security of the, of the people, reduce the risks to their lives and integrity, and to protect them from situation that increases their vulnerability uh, while they're on the move. The crisis is once again making it evident how important it is to strengthen cooperation. The need to have better and stronger humanitarian responses based on international uh, human rights law. The need to strengthen the international governments of migration so that we can rise to the occasion. I celebrate this dialogue for several reasons. First, I'd like to congratulate you with for choosing the topics that will the sessions will work against with reducing the risks and vulnerabilities for migrants the importance to facilitate regular migration and the need to advance social and economic inclusion of migrants it's impossible not to focus on how to save lives and protect those who are already in a vulnerable position of situations such as the human trafficking, how how can we avoid talking about securing basic rights through regularization and how to tackle these structural inequalities and also on the need to advance towards inclusive social protection systems, hopefully universal ones, so we can be better prepared to face crises such as that that we have faced in the pandemic and also to recover better from those crises and to be better prepared for those we may face in the future. All of these areas are relevant, as we have said, for member states in our efforts to prepare towards the International Migration Review Forum. This dialogue becomes more relevant because it's so close to the review period. Our discussions can inform in a significant and pertinent way the, IM, the IMRF, but they're also important due to its inclusivity and its transparency. So giving opportunity to the different stakeholders to share their views, their knowledge and their experience in the search for better practices uh, to find issues to resolve and also in order to take the necessary measures when starting the second uh, implementation period for the global compact. As the general director said, we have huge challenges in order to recover the lost ground, both from the global compact and also on the uh, sustainable development goals, but also due to the higher inequalities to the challenges that we have to face due to climate change, to the need to reduce the risks um, against disasters and emergencies and protecting those, those displaced communities. The huge challenge of combating discrimination and xenophobia against all populations and migrant peoples. We have to increase our technical ability in a coordinated manner which with integral uh, actions and also with actions where the role of multilateral discussions such as today's will be fundamental. The level of the panelists that have been invited to this discussion is also a guarantee that the conversations will be highly pro productive and their outcomes uh, very necessary. I would like to end alerting all member states, uh, asking them to take part in this dialogue today to review all the efforts that have been carried out so far both by the General Secretary and by the organization, and to use the results that we have consolidated so far in order to prepare all our responses and efforts towards the IMRF. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best uh, for the success of today's debate.
Many thanks, uh, esteemed president. I reiterate my thanks to all who have participated. And now I ask uh, the Deputy Director General of IOM, uh, Ugoshi Daniels, to uh, moderate the first panel of this afternoon. Ugoshi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DG, and good afternoon, Your Excellencies, colleagues from IOM. It's a pleasure for me to be moderating this panel with such an esteemed guest of panelists. More than 47,000 people have died during migration journeys worldwide since 2014, according to IOM's Missing Migrants Project. Many more migrants' deaths remain undocumented, both those who die on irregular pathways and in destination countries. Beyond this, migrant bodies, even when documented, are only rarely identified, meaning that countless families face the ambiguous loss of not knowing what happened to their relatives after they left home. Many of those affected by such a loss are women and girls who have lost a husband, father, or brother, who, beyond the terrible grief of losing a loved one, face legal, social, economic, and administrative barriers linked to the loss of a head of household or breadwinner. It's very unfortunate, scenes involving dozens and sometimes hundreds of migrant lives lost at sea or on land have become all too frequent. Some of the images like that of two-year-old Alan Kurdi or Valeria Martinez Ramirez will forever haunt us. Scenes involving dozens and sometimes hundreds of migrant lives lost at sea need to become a thing of the past. The COVID-19 pandemic has adversely impacted efforts to make migration safer and prevent deaths and disappearances. There's evidence that pandemic-related border closures have reduced already limited opportunities for regular migration, pushing more people to take unsafe, irregular routes that put them at greater risk of disappearance and death. The Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration evokes a moral and humanitarian imperative to prevent the loss of life and other tragedies during migration. Objective eight of the compact includes commitments and a range of actions for governments and stakeholders to save lives and to establish coordinated international efforts on missing migrants. However, as highlighted in the report of the Secretary General, objective eight of the compact has received too little attention from governments, with very few examples of concrete actions provided in the 2021 regional reviews. As such, the IMRF will be an opportunity to reinvigorate this commitment, and we hope that today's panel will feed into this process. We have three really outstanding speakers. As I started off, it's a privilege for me to be moderating this panel. And, and they will present good practices as well as challenges faced on the ground when trying to prevent the loss of life during migration, assisting the families of those left behind and protecting migrants in vulnerable situations. On the panel, I'm very pleased. We have Miriam Yassin Haki Yusuf, the Special Envoy for Children's and Migrants' Rights, Office of the Prime Minister, the Federal Public of Somalia, who will share Somalia's experience in protecting migrants, including migrants in countries in crises, and those who have returned from a treacherous journey across the Sea of Aden. We're also joined by Florian van Koenig, Deputy Head, Missing Persons Project at the ICRC, who will focus on identification and the impacts of migrant deaths on the families left behind. Spelling out steps that are required um, when re 
when a missing person is reported by a family, identification of remains and international information sharing. And we're also joined by Lala Arabian, the executive manager and project coordinator for INSAN Association, cross-regional center for refugees and migrants. He will speak on the protection of migrants in vulnerable situations with a focus on migrant children, women, and young girls. And dear panelists, you're very welcome. And let me start with Ambassador Yassin. In your current role as Special Envoy, you've been at the front lines saving lives and rescuing stranded migrants in Somalia and abroad. Could you share with us your thoughts on how migrant deaths could be prevented and any examples you have of innovative practices that have contributed to saving the lives of migrants? Do you have any suggestions as to how we can achieve greater focus and results on objective eight of the GCM? Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much um, um, for giving me the floor. Um, I am very pleased to be here today and represent the Somali government. And on behalf of the uh, Somali government, I wish to extend um, our greetings to the IOM colleagues, to the president of the UN um, General Assembly and to His Excellency Vittorino and, and all the colleagues of IOM and the uh, member state as well. Um, as you are aware, uh, Somalia is a country of origin and is a country of um, destination and transit of um, mixed migration flows in the Horn of Africa, but also coming from, uh, from Yemen. Um, we have been in front line in rescue missions um, when it comes to stranded Somali migrants um, across the globe. And we've been closely working with IOM with the support of the European Union. And when we say that um, since to 2014, we um, had 14,000 people that lost their life during migration journeys. Um, what really uh, struck my mind is that those thousands and thousands out there who lost their lives and they have not get the chance to even be documented. Most of the um, numbers um, the, of the missing migrants are being told to us by, by the survivors of this very risky and, and dangerous journey. Somalia is committed to the implementation of the um, GCM and we live in a situation of really a complexity of um, migration reality, which is um, further complicated by different factors of the country, including the um, instability posed by Al-Shabaab, the conflicts, the climate change, the drought, and other vulnerabilities that are faced by migrants crossing the country, but also the host community that are also forced to um, migrate. Um, it is a sad reality, and I, I, I say that really with, um, and as a, some, somebody who's been in front line um, with uh, colleagues from the government in rescue um, operations, um, many of our youth are still embarking in risky and an irregular journey. And sometimes we really ask ourselves, what is the way out? And um, according um, to IOM data, um, in a short period of time, in 2021, 7,000 Somali youth crossed the um, country um, irregularly. And they go all sort of human rights violation, unlawful det detention and kidnapping. I came to know yesterday from a family that um, has um, contacted um, my team through our embassy in, uh, in New York, that there's one particular a migrant that he, who is now held kid, um, kidnapped by human traffickers and the brother and the family paid so far a ransom of $30,000. This is the highest amount I hear since I've been appointed in this um, position um, in 2016. 
So we see that unfortunately more um, human rights um, uh, are violated and more these networks of criminals are more and more connected and they're reaching out to our youth more um, before us. So um, we would like to bring as, um, as, um, as an example, the diaspora commitment when it comes to the Somali diaspora. But before that, I also would like to highlight that um, as, a, as our um, commitment to the GCM, but also commitment to the people of Somalia, the government of Somalia is committed to address the root causes of the various um, organized um, um, you know, um, ways of irregular migration and uh, and also tackling insecurity, poverty, so on and so on and forth. Um, the diaspora has been really um, in front line in development in Somalia, in the political participation, but also bringing, coming back home and starting off businesses, involving the youth and giving a lot of job opportunities. I am myself a person from the diaspora, and so many of us have returned home voluntarily to contribute to the development of the country on the different phases, and especially in the business. Um, Somali diaspora have been bringing back their expertise as, um, as a migration also um, 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 expert, but also really understanding the root causes that force so many of our people to um, to migrate irregularly. And as we talk, um, we have also working closely with the Somali diaspora and the Somali business community to make sure that job opportunities are given to the survivors of um, of um, of human trafficking in uh, Somalia. Um, I don't want, I, I don't know if you have further questions for me or, or I can go on. I don't know if you want to bring in others on board or you want me to continue. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador. Why don't we do a round, um, we'll Perfect. finish with all the panelists. We also have um, uh, statements that will be uh, that will come from the floor, and then if we have any time after that, then I will certainly come back to you. Um, so right now, I would and, and thank you very much again. Uh, you're excellent. most welcome. And now I move on to Florian, um, and thank you once again for joining us. Of course, the ICRC has been a long-standing international actor helping to resolve missing persons cases through the Missing Persons Project. So in this context, can you tell us more about how deaths and disappearances in the context of migration pose unique challenges and how Objective eight of the Global Compact on Migration can help to address these. And what about the guidance on missing migrants that ICRC has developed with civil society actors? Could you please also share with us um, uh, the details uh, regarding this guidance? So over to you, Florian. Thank you very much, uh, Mogoshi, for the... Um invitation to participate in this very important discussions. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Loud and clear, go Perfect. ahead. Okay, um, well, yeah, greetings from Geneva, from the um, Central Tracing Agency, which is the part of the um, ICRC that I work for. And while the Missing Persons Project that you have just mentioned um, has been doing its work for four years now, the Central Tracing Agency has been looking for missing persons for about 150 years. And missing migrants is becoming a, a more and more important part of that. Um, and so I'd like to focus on four challenges. Um, the first one, the first challenge that I see is, and you already mentioned it in your, in your um, introduction, is the challenge of scope. Um, you mentioned 47,000 um, people that have uh, gone missing since 2014. We know this is an undercount because many deaths are simply not reported. There is also um, the thousands of migrants who go missing a life um, because they're in detention, because they're in a situation where they cannot uh, communicate with their family. They might be stuck in a conflict zone. They might be unaccompanied children. There's also the question of scope 
geographically. Um, so what we observe is that often the question of missing migrants is perceived as one of death at sea. And um, that is simply not the case. There are so many other situations in which migrants go missing all along migration routes. Um, you have uh, people going missing in, in deserts, um, in the jungle, in the Darien Gap. Um, you have a lot of migrants go missing actually in countries of destination. So that means all these countries of transit and destination they're affected by this problem and they need to be part of the solution. And that also counts for countries of origin, because this is where a lot of the families are. And it's the families that start the search. It's the families that actually report uh, in most cases that somebody has gone missing. So there is a very important role for countries of um, origin as well. The second issue I'd like to mention is um, perhaps the most important one to me is invisibility, or oh, that's how I would call it. Um, and, and, and we know if something is not visible, um, then you don't feel particularly compelled to do something about it. And that is a big problem when we talk about missing migrants, because irregular migration is often clandestine, and it happens out of view. And that is, for example, a problem when it comes to prevention. There's examples of migratory policies and practices, pushbacks, for example, that um, contribute directly to people going missing and dying. And the less visibility these practices receive, um, the less visible they are, the more, the easier is it simply to, con to continue these practices. Um, and that, that fits into the broader issue of rights and protection. I think it's important to reiterate that even though um, Irregular migration might be taking place out of sight. That does not mean it's taking place in a legal vacuum. And migrants, like everyone else, um, are protected by international law, by international human rights law, and states have corresponding obligations, including as regards search and rescue, the prohibition of uh, enforced disappearance, and many other principles and rules and standards. The third issue, the third challenge I want to focus on is the impact of families. And you've already mentioned um, some of the, the key points, the fact that families really find themselves in a state of limbo, not knowing what happened to their loved one. The economic impact, which you just mentioned, the legal impact of uh, a husband who disappears, the wife might not even have control of a property uh, guardianship of children until the situation is resolved. There's also often a case of stigma of an of a failed migratory project. And where families are themselves migrants, um, their integration into host countries might actually be affected because such families tend to invest everything they have into searching for their missing relative. And how do you search if your relative has gone missing thousands of miles away, possibly on a different continent? And, and that brings me to the, to the fourth point, which is the complexity of the response. So if you look at the search process, you need to know who is actually missing. And for this, families and others need to be able to record, to register cases in countries of origin, in countries of transit, and in countries of destination, because that is where families are. And this information includes basic personal data on the sort person, their physical appearance, the migration route that they have taken, and anything else that could help their location and identification. Then on the other hand, you have information on unidentified human remains, on people who have died in an accident or persons who are alive but unable to reestablish contact with their families. And it's these two sets of information that you need to compare and, and, and match to ultimately find or identify someone. And this effort needs to start. It needs to start at the national level to ensure that unidentified human remains, for example, are recorded, managed in a dignified manner, and that information on missing persons is similarly recorded, and that both are centralized at national level. And then, of course, all this information needs to be shared transnationally. And for this, you need to have mechanisms in place that allow states of origin, of transit and destination, but also families and different organizations that hold information to cooperate in the search and to exchange information. And linked to this really is a need to protect data because the migratory context is so sensitive. Families may simply not provide information on missing persons if they fear that it's going to be used for immigration control or other purposes. So is it complicated? Yes, it is very complicated. When can it be done? 
Absolutely. And there is a it, there is a growing number of examples that show how it can be done. Maybe a word then on, on objective eight, the part of the which is a part of the GCM that we at the ICRC have really pushed for in 2018 to make sure states include it. And um, it really is perhaps the most comprehensive international commitment we have on this issue. And that makes it very precious. So it's all the more unfortunate that, as you mentioned, implementation has really fallen short of what we hope for. And some of the things I just mentioned probably account for this. And it includes a, a lack of know-how on what actually to do. And so we see for the way forward for the IMRF, the goal really has to be to move from what is today a global commitment to tangible action on the ground along migratory routes. And there's a clear role here to play for regional actors, for regional migration dialogues and conferences, and many others, including perhaps the regional networks of the, of the GCM. And um, so we're really hopeful that the IMRF will give new impetus to that. And now to, um, to finish, perhaps you mentioned um, a project that we've been working on for four years um, and cooperated on uh, in, with a lot of people, including um, the IOM uh, Missing Migrants Project and many others. Um, um, and this is based on the practices that I just mentioned. There are actually a growing number of examples that show how missing migrants can be found and identified. And, and I'll just give you very few examples. You may remember in, in, in Europe, there was a truck in Austria in 2015 with 17, 70 migrants on, on it um, who, who were all deceased. There was a boat that sank in the English channel um, last November, um, killing 28 migrants. And in both cases, in fact, um, every single person, with two exceptions, was identified within a matter of weeks. And so it is possible. We have examples today where in Tunisia, the country is regularly identifying victims of shipwrecks using information that is supplied, amongst others, from authorities in Ivory Coast. We have South Africa and Zimbabwe who have set up a cross-border commission, committee, to, um, to deal with missing migrants uh, uh, from Zimbabwe in South Africa. We have in the Americas uh, Proyecto Frontera, which is a, a joint project of civil society and government authorities in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala that has created a network system of databases that contain thousands of DNA profiles of families looking for uh, missing loved ones who, who went missing in migration. And they have actually identified 250, more than 250 migrants who went missing in Mexico and in the United States. And there's an effort underway in the Americas uh, among the regional conference on migration there to adopt a set of recommendations on regional information exchange and cooperation in the search for missing migrants. So over the past three years, we have worked with practitioners, experts from around the world to look at these practices and to um, draw lessons and best practices from them. And the outcome of this, and this was published a couple of weeks ago, is uh, uh, three publications. The first one is a set of guidelines on the creation of search mechanisms along migration routes, which sets out the requirements at the national level and then the prerequisites for successful transnational cooperation on the basis of a multi-stakeholder model. The second is a set of guiding principles on the interaction with families of missing migrants who are absolutely central to the search process and who face very specific challenges in a migratory context. And the third one is a data set uh, for the search, a core data set that is intended to help set up and harmonize data collection efforts along a route. And so these documents are part of a much broader effort that the ICRC is involved in to mobilize states and others to cooperate on missing migrants and to provide technical advice um, and tools uh, um, to that purpose. And, and we hope they'll be useful. And thank you for letting me present it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian, um, for really outlining the complexity of the issue, but also um, examples of how it's done and, and sharing the effort um, by ICRC over the years to provide guidance and tools on how to on how to do this, um, even in the even with all the all the complexity. So thank you very much for sharing. And now, um, Lala Arabian, I'd like to thank you for joining us um, to bring the perspective of Insan Association on the protection and promotion of the rights of the most marginalized individual families 
and children living in Lebanon, such as refugees, migrant workers, and asylum seekers. We're also grateful to hear about the effort at the cross-regional, at the level of the cross-regional network initiated by INSAN in 2017, called the Cross-Regional Center for Refugees and Migrants that brings together local and national organizations across the regions of the Middle East, North Africa, the Gulf, and the Mediterranean. So can you tell us about the work carried out at the level of INSAN and the Cross-Regional Center to advance the provision of life-saving humanitarian assistance and the safeguarding of human rights along migratory routes. We would be really keen to hear about your work in the area of protection of migrant women and children. And what do you think are the priorities of the action committee members for the IMRF regarding objectives seven and eight of the GCM? Ms. Arabian, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much first for having me on this very important panel. Um, Insan Association established in 1998 works to protect and promote the rights of the most vulnerable individuals and communities living in Lebanon, which are most notably migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers who arrive to Lebanon through different routes seeking for a better life. For asylum seekers and refugees, Lebanon is a country of transition and not a country of destination. So they hope to be able to be resettled in a third country to rebuild their lives and to be protected. However, with all the economic, political, and health crisis escalating very rapidly in Lebanon in the past few years, we have witnessed more and more migrants, refugees, and also Lebanese nationals who are trying to leave the country using what we call the death boats through the Mediterranean Sea. We have seen many incidents where many lives were lost, especially those of women and children who are the most vulnerable in these situations as well, while at the open sea and before reaching any borders because of the overloading of the boats and not taking any security measures into consideration with the sole aim for smugglers to gain as much money as they can in the expense of lives of people. There are others who survived and told their stories. They have sold everything they own their homes, their furniture, their gold, everything, in order to secure a place for them and their families on these boats. And now that the, the attempt has failed, they had nothing left and no means to survive in their own country. These are very tragic incidents. And even after all these stories are told, people are still willing to take the risk. And they risk everything, including their lives and the lives of their loved ones, since life in the country they are in has become undignified and unbearable. In migration, women and children are the most vulnerable, as they are often subjected to all kinds of abuse, especially women migrants in domestic work. We see like they are the most um, weakest link. And then children who are born in the region. And uh, when I say like, I'm not talking only in Lebanon, like in the whole, uh, in, the re in our region. Uh, children who are born from migrant uh, women who are in domestic work have also addi additional risks as they become undocumented in many times because it is usually not allowed for migrant domestic workers to have any family life or to have children in the countries where they work in. And by that, these children lose all prospect of accessing any of their rights. So as Insan, we do work with all these categories of women and children and these communities. And we try as much as we can using legal paths, using the courts to try to secure some of the, um, uh, like for children, for example, who are undocumented, we try to secure any documentation that can help them um, to register them or to, to, to have access to schools and to healthcare. Uh, and it's really, really hard for women as well. So we have established shelters um, where we, uh, where children and, and women are welcomed um, in these situations. And all the time we are trying to work while they are in the shelter, trying to work for their, uh, you know, like uh, to find solutions basically for them. And now if I uh, pass to the, uh, on the cross-regional level. So uh, at the cross-regional center for refugees and migrants, 
As we are a cross-regional network, we have member organizations from, uh, as, as you said, from Middle East, North Africa, but specifically we have in, from Lebanon, from Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Bahrain, Kuwait, UAE, Morocco, Tunisia, Italy, Spain, Cyprus, and Turkey. So we cover around the Mediterranean basin. Our members in the different region uh, are trying to build bridges. So what we are trying to do in this network, we are trying to build bridges around the Mediterranean to unify efforts as civil society in assisting migrants on both sides of the basin. So between the Arab countries and Europe. As civil society, and as stated in the Global Civil Society Priorities for the International Migration Review Forum, we believe that it is essential to incorporate transnational mechanisms and interstate cooperation to search for disappeared migrants, whether alive or deceased. This should include cooperation between states of origin, transit, and destination, to share genetic data and also relevant information and other relevant information, sorry, with strict parameters of confidentiality, privacy safeguards, and firewalls effective against any other use of data in order to facilitate access to justice for families of disappeared persons and victims of massacres or extrajudicial executions and other, and other crimes. It is also essential for states to seek the assistance of civil society and organizations who are working to protect the rights of migrants and refugees and to have open coordination and cooperation with them in order to have best results in saving migrant lives and investigating for missing migrants. Civil society and its diversity as regards to services, approaches, and strategies constitutes the natural environment where all segments of society can trust and benefit from. Therefore, it should also be considered as a natural partner for governments and UN agencies who are seeking to uphold rights of people. Civil society should be recognized as an essential partner and actor for both governments and UN agencies to cooperate with and not to be regarded only as a threat. Without cooperation between these parties, no effective solution and protection for migrants can be achieved. Moreover, organizations working on the ground in, the, uh, in assisting migrants should be granted protection and not fought by governments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Arabian, for your, uh, for your remarks. I think what we are clearly seeing is the need for a transnational approach, transnational mechanisms, um, cooperation, and the role for various actors um, in coming up with solutions um, uh, on this particular issue around, around rights, around um, missing migrants, around the conditions um, migrants have to deal with. So, so thank you very much for that. We have quite a few requests um, from the floor to, uh, uh, for people who would like to speak. So I'm going to have to ask um, everyone not to exceed two minutes. Um, I do need to go back to the panelists so that they can give their concluding remarks. Um, and we... Um, uh, hopefully we'll finish within the next uh, 45 minutes so we don't go over time. So thank you very much once again to the panelists. I'll now go to the floor before I come back to each of you for your concluding remarks. And I start first with, oh, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dehan, who is going to manage the requests that, from the floor. Thank so you, thank you very much, Nizan. Over to you. Thank you, DG. Uh, now, the first, we have the representative of the Bolivian Republic of Venezuela, Vice Minister for Multilateral Affairs of the Bolivian Republic of Venezuela, Ruben Dario Molina. It's a video recorded message. Please. Excelencia, agradecemos la convocatoria a este importante. Excelency, we would like to thank you for this important dialogue on. Uh, migration which allows us to evaluate the current situation a topic which is very important and which evolution and progress has been affected by the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic the Bolivian Republic of Venezuela has been historically a welcoming land 
with solidarity to all the migrants of everywhere in the world. We have um, hosted them with any kind of request of monetary resource. We haven't monetized on migration migrants with their own offer efforts. They had prospered, they've had access to healthcare, education and well-being within our people, managing to have in our country a non-discriminatory homeland. This is a tradition which has not been broken despite the cruel and the inhumane lateral measures that the United States of America had applied together with its uh, EU allies. The induced migration product of the aggression to the independent economic and sovereign de development of Venezuela affects all the population without distinction and it is um, hosted in a use of a false uh, human rights uh, flag. We would like to condemn this aggression which is basically an aggression of xenophobia and um, workforce exploitation, trafficking of people with criminal purposes, the gender violence and social exclusion. The victims, as always, are the most vulnerable people in the society. We would like to denounce also the market-based use of our migrants, countries, organizations, uh, programs and agencies which had requested them millions of dollars uh, conducting international campaigns offering to our national citizens some kind of well-being. Those will be held accountable for this. From Venezuela, we believe that the migrants are an important engine of um, ordered, concerted and cooperative means of progress. When they come to these uh, countries, they, they can also have and enjoy well-being and they have the guaranteed return when they want to do so. We support the road of map stated by the Global Compact for a safe and ordered and regular migration, which will get the objectives to reach a peaceful world and which uh, progress we will assess during the May Committee. Mr. Director, the state of Venezuela has always showed its uh, willingness to the dialogue and cooperation with its neighbors and with all the counters in favor of regularizing the processes with regards to the uh, regularization and the migration of uh, its citizens. Sense. And also with dignity, Venezuela has a, an increasing and very close relationship of technical assistance with the system of the United Nations based in the respect to the Charter of the United Nations. It is a willingness that we would like to renew here today. Finally, we would like to reiterate our commitment and we would like to applaud the efforts done by the United States to tackle this phenomenon, which is not new, but today it is a great global challenge that which force us to go forward the multilateral consensus in favor of the prosperity of our peoples. In this spirit, we will carry on contributing to the strengthening of the Global Compact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker on our list is Representative of uh, People's Republic of China, Chan Jie, Director General of the Department of Policy and Regulation, National Immigration Administration. You're muted, sir. Sir, you're muted. Sir, we cannot hear you. Okay, now? Yes, go ahead, yeah. please. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Excellency, distinguished uh, delegates, I would like to share some of our regulations and practices on safeguarding legitimate rights and interests of vulnerable immigrants. First, China's laws and regulations clearly stipulate that under five specific circumstances, irregular foreign migrants are not subject to detention for investigation. Other foreign nationals under immigration detention or investigation may apply for administrative reconsideration in accordance with law. Second, China immigration has always properly and kindly processed illegal immigrants, especially women and minors, in accordance with domestic and international laws and principles of humanitarianism. In the pilot program, AVRR, 
with IOM. Vulnerable groups have always been its first priority and has successfully helped 44 people voluntarily return to their countries of origin so far. Third, during this pandemic, China's epidemic prevention departments have carried out undifferentiated medical observation and treatment for foreign nationals. China's immigration agencies have provided immigrants with timely guidance, facilitated their stay and residence, and taken measures to help entry of foreign nationals with emergencies and humanitarian reasons. We call for resolutely cracking down on racial discrimination, hate crimes, stigmatization against immigrants, politicization of health issues, and work together to create a fair and favorable environment for immigrants. Ladies and gentlemen, since the adoption of the GCM, China has conscientiously fulfilled the compass requirement promoting normal personnel exchanges and safeguarded legitimate rights and interests of immigrants. We will continue to uphold the vision of building a community with a shared future for mankind, actively participate in global cooperation on migration governance, and support the role of the UN and IOM as the main channels, in particular, IOM's active role as the coordinator and secretariat of the UN Network on Migration. China Immigration is ready to work with our counterparts to create a favorable environment for normal migration growth. And I thank you all. Thank you. Now, the next on our list is a representative of Sri Lanka from the permanent uh, representation of Sri Lanka and UN. Please, sir, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the Sri Lankan delegation thanks the panel for the insightful thoughts on the issues affecting the rights and the vulnerabilities of migrants. As outlined in the Objective 7 of the Global Compact, in a spirit of sharing our experiences, Sri Lanka would like to brief the panel of the procedures that we have adopted nationally in this regard. In the context of ensuring safe, orderly and regular migration, Sri Lanka, which is important to protect migrant workers from exposure to vulnerable situations, Sri Lanka conducts awareness programs among migrant workers on the benefits of using regular channels for migration and the danger of using irregular channels. We have even taken steps to screen migrant workers at the airport with a view to detecting the individuals using regular channels and to sensitize them on the risks associated. Several statutory and law enforcement measures are being taken against both licensed and unlicensed foreign employment agencies engaged in irregular migration to discourage such occurrences. With a view to making migrant workers aware of the work-related risks, Sri Lanka provides a pre-departure training program for all first-time migrant workers, particularly in the domestic household sector. Regular capacity building measures are undertaken to enhance the competencies in our network of foreign missions to deal with the problem of vulnerability of migrant workers. The Sri Lanka Bureau of Foreign Employment has appointed officers to 15 employment and welfare sections maintaining 13 labor receiving countries to provide assistance to migrant workers for employment related issues and to address other connected grievances. As an added measure, pre uh, preliminary arrangements are being made to launch mobile app for Sri Lankan migrant workers, providing them with the facility to lodge complaints directly through the app and also provide details related to their current employer and whereabouts to locate them in case of emergency. These measures have contributed significantly to meet objective seven and eight of the GCM, uh, which commits to save life and establish coordinated international efforts. I thank you. Thank you, sir. We have uh, on our list uh, uh, three, four more. Uh, one more representative of Sri Lanka, this time Mr. Ruben Herrera, Regional Coordinator of the Child Migration Project in Central America and Mexico, uh, SOS Children's Village. Please go ahead. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, 
In Thank lugar. you very much. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Ruben Herrera and would like to share, say hello from Aldeas Infantiles and would like to share the experience of the project uh, of the improvement of the life of teenagers within the context of Central America in Mexico within the cooperation department between 2017 and 2021 with the goal of improving the lives of these children and teenagers uh, for those in irregular migration in Mexico, Honduras and El Salvador. The first objective was uh, addressing more than 8,000 boys, girls and empowering their rights and informing them on the rights. Also, pathways were established uh, and an early attention in the case of Honduras, uh, amongst other experiences. The second one was to strengthen the protection services for teenagers. So they promoted information and uh, different initiatives were carried out in the government of five countries. Uh, the emotional recovery, this was also taking shape in a project uh, which was provided in El Salvador, and also agreements were provided, uh, the education and migration departments in each of the countries. And finally, political advocacy was carried out to promote their rights, especially the work carried out by civil society organizations in Mexico and implemented in this country for the harmonization of the services for teenagers, but also the approval of public policies for children and teenagers and the prevention and attention for teenage migrants. The most important aspect is the coordinated and joint work between the different actors and the way to protect the protection services so migration is informed and the, the rights of the most vulnerable people are respected. I would like to thank you again for allowing us to, to have this space. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We still have three uh, requests for intervention. The first one on our list that is coming now, it's Laurel Townhead, uh, France World Committee for Consultation, followed by Representative Council of Europe and then followed by Spain. Laurel, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, DDG. Thank you, Chair. And thanks to the panelists and other speakers who shared both their concern and their, uh, the continued loss of life and their efforts to respond to it. We welcome this focus in the IDM, especially in light of the shocking, but sadly not surprising analysis that Objective 8 has received too little attention. The discussions today, last week in the Human Rights Council Intercessional Panel and next week in the IMRF Dialogue are all welcome, especially as new and escalating crises add to the numbers of people trying to cross borders to seek protection and dignity. Collectively, we need to ensure that this increased attention leads to lasting impact. Having taken this time to look more closely at this issue and to hear from those dedicated to responding to loss of life, we must, simply, we must not simply look away again. In the New York Declaration, states said, we are determined to save lives. Our challenge is above all moral and humanitarian. Preparatory discussions like today can be used to help translate this determination into political will at the IMRF in the Progress Declaration and beyond. Just as action on mitigation and response needs to be stepped up, concrete action on prevention of loss of life is also needed. And as the Secretary General's report says, efforts must be extended to preventing deaths and suffering through systemic and policy changes that address the risks inherent in migration frameworks. Ahead of the IMRF, thought should be given to what mechanisms can bring continued attention and inform and support the policy assessment and revision recommended. We ask, is it time to consider what role a high level panel on deaths in transit could play in ensuring sustained attention, bringing expert analysis and convening corridor specific dialogues for the prevention of loss of life? As we've heard throughout this panel, the human cost of the status quo requires us to find new responses 
the IMRF and the Progress Declaration should be leveraged to turn intention into effective action for prevention of loss of life. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to the representative of the Council of Europe and our translators ask us to speak slow as, as that they can also translate properly. Thank you. Um, do you hear me? I don't know if you Yes, okay. Um, so distinguished director, general moderator, distinguished panelists and colleagues. Last May, the Council of Europe adopted its five-year action plan on protecting vulnerable persons in the context of migration and asylum in Europe. This action plan was endorsed by all 47 member states of our Committee of Ministers. The special representative of the Secretary General of Migration and Refugees is coordinating its implementation. The action plan, the new one, aims at addressing main challenges and opportunities identified since the previous action plan, which was focusing on children, was completed in 2019. The lessons learned, along with discussions with member states and within the Council of Europe, revealed the need for further action and coordination in a wider space. The European Court of Human Rights, as well as our steering committees and monitoring bodies, have emphasized the special protection that states need to provide to vulnerable persons in the context of asylum and migration. In the new action plan, in the new action plan, vulnerable persons in the context of migration and asylum are persons found to have special needs after individual evaluation of the situation and are entitled to call on state's obligation to provide special protection and assistance. The proposed definition of vulnerability draws on the existing legal standards of the Council of Europe and reflects the same meaning as the one used in European law, like in the EU Directive on Reception. Actions undertaken in the framework of this uh, new action plan are structured around the three pillars of the Council of Europe mandate, that is, on human rights. It aims to support member states in strengthening the safeguards and systems in place to prevent and to respond to abuse, neglect, exploitation, of and violence against migrants and refugees in vulnerable situations. On the rule of law, it aims at improving member states' justice system to be adapted to vulnerable migrants, including children, legal aid and procedures concerning migrants and refugees in vulnerable situations without discrimination and with the appropriate procedural safeguards, in line with relevant Council of Europe standards. On democracy, it aims at supporting member states to enhance inclusion and foster democratic participation through the enabling exercise of the right to education in line with relevant Council of Europe standards. Legal professionals working with migrants and refugees in member states become familiar with European standards on topics such as hate crime, hate speech, harassment and racist or homophobic grounds. In addition, the fourth pillar focuses on support for transversal cooperation through the existing Council of Europe network of focal points on migration. This latter is composed of our member states' representatives dealing with migration management in their respective countries. The objectives of the proposed actions are, one, to provide practical guidance to member states on how to identify and address vulnerabilities through their asylum and migration procedures, including reception procedures, then to promote good practices in embedding pertinent procedural safeguards for those identified as vulnerable in a migration context, to support intercultural integration and social inclusion, as well as education, and to facilitate direct dialogue with migration and asylum authorities and enable intersectoral and cross-border exchanges. This activity is to be carried out in the five-year time frame, frame of this, this action plan are translated in concrete projects to be implemented in the member states, shall they wish to take advantage of those. Last but not least, let me emphasize that by implementing this overarching action plan on protecting vulnerable persons in the context of migration and asylum in Europe, the Council of Europe contributes further to the implementation of many important objectives of the Global Compact for Migration. I thank you very much. Thank you. We actually now have two requests from the floor. One is uh, came from Spain, another on Holy See, if time permitting. Spain, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief. To fight uh, for uh, goal eight, we need an articulated action and joint action in four phases of the migrant uh, person who, who has to be at the center of our interest. 
First of all, prevention, prevention of those deep grounds that take a person to be so desperate as to risk their own life. Secondly, protection, protection of migrants, which is fighting against uh, smuggling and trafficking networks, which, which violate human rights of migrants. It has been very interesting, the reference that the um, Somali ambassador about the, the news uh, for someone who for whom $30,000 were asked to liberate. We must not forget that the, those networks are the basis for the violation of the rights of migrants. The third stage is rescuing, and all states are obliged to do, to do so, whether it's because they put their lives at risk at sea or the desert. It's our... Um, we are obliged to do so, even if the means are limited, we do not have the ob objectives that should be desirable. My country is very much involved in rescuing. And unfortunately, we've seen in these years in, in, at, in the sea, in the Atlantic uh, Ocean, etc., we see there is a completely inadmissible number of people who lose their lives. And finally, the fourth phase is to honor those who have disappeared, those migrants looking for a better life have either lost their lives or have gone missing. We can do it in many different ways. Obviously, it's to identify the remains of those people who have lost their lives and contacting their families and to move those remains to the more to the closer communities where their families are located. And thirdly, it's another way to honor those who have disappeared or lost their lives so that that loss has not been in vain. It's to carry on fighting against this impunity and also giving families and relatives and friends of those disappeared access to justice so they can fight against those uh, irregular migration networks who, who are ultimately responsible for the loss and disappearance of those relatives, uh, husbands, wives, or children uh, who lost their lives trying to reach or to have, find a better future. Many thanks, Excellency. Uh, the last but not least on our request uh, list is the Holy See. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And thank you also to the distinguished panelists for their very um, helpful presentation. The Holy See welcomes uh, this uh, first session of the 2022 International Dialogue on Migration in preparation for the International Migration Review Forum. Uh, today, um, states and other stakeholders can uh, uh, renew our shared commitment to addressing the manifold challenges of migration and prepare to the assess the progress made in advancing the fulfillment of the objectives of the GCM. Migration is a global phenomenon with differentiated impacts and to be effective, a global response to migration must be the fruit of a common effort to develop a form of global governance that accounts for the repercussions of migration movements at all levels and for every country. Uh, in this regard, the Holy See considers it's crucial for the international community uh, to continue working towards the adoption of a coherent and comprehensive system for coordinating policies on migration uh, with the view of sharing responsibility for the reception and protection of migrants, their eventual relocation and full integration in a society. Uh, in particular, greater attention should be given to the effective implementation of Objective 8 of the GCM. Uh, as the Secretary General highlighted in his uh, recent report, uh, the commitment to saving lives uh, and establishing coordinating international efforts on uh, missing migrants has uh, yet to be translated into meaningful action. Thousands of migrant deaths continue to occur globally, both along regular and irregular migration routes. In light of this, it is essential that the states strengthen procedures and agreements on the search and rescue of migrants with the primary objective of protecting migrants' right to life. 
and comply with their international obligations at borders and along migratory routes. Uh, states must find a right balance between uh, their twofold moral responsibility to protect uh, their citizens and their rights and uh, to provide assistance uh, to migrants and assure their integration within a society. Uh, in conclusion, the Holy See reiterates uh, the importance of developing and implementing a holistic and integrated approach to migration that centers on the inherent dignity of migrants, promotes uh, their integral human development, and ensures effective protection of and respect for the human rights and fundamental freedoms of migrants, regardless of their migration status. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. I would like to return back to floor to our Deputy Director General, please. Thank you, Dejan. And thank you very much, Excellencies, distinguished participants for your statements. And now I go back to our distinguished panelists. You have about three minutes each to give concluding remarks. And may I start with you, Ambassador Miriam? Thank you very much, um, Madam. Um, I'd like to be brief as much as I can. Government officials are well known for you know speaking a lot, but I'll try to be concise. First of all, allow me to um, um, just um, express my gratitude to the Council of Europe and, and, and just greet the representative from the Council of Europe. I mean, back in, in Italy in the 90s, I was trained by the Council of Europe programs for young migrants leaders and um, I've been working closely with the Council of Europe. So it's quite, you know, an, an, an important event also today because this shows when migrants are given the opportunities they can reach far and the council of europe gave me that opportunity and i started my youth activism in in the centers in strasbourg and budapest so thank you very much i would like to highlight three major points return the return of migrants in crisis situation the return of migrants is a right Every right, every migrant has the right to return home, but also the return also becomes prevention, even if it's at the latest stage. Um, when I went to think to the IOM and the EU when we went to Libya in 2018 was to give us to give a strong message to our stranded migrant there and tell them the country is here to receive you back home. And that was a prevention since then. We have rescued over 2,500 young men and women who return back home. So at least, um, and with reintegration packages. The return is not just the final destination, the, re the reintegration of the migrants back in the society is the aim we are looking for, okay, um, for sure, in a very safe, dignified and voluntarily manner. I wish to highlight here the presence of women in this extreme situation, Libya and other countries. Women yet are having issues in returning because of the double um, it, the vulnerability of women and children in this dangerous crossing has been highlighted and women suffer the stigma. When I was in Libya, a young Somali woman told me uh, my mother spent over 18,000 dollars in ransom. I don't have the courage to face her back with nothing. So women will try, will be exploited, um, will be more prone to cross into the Mediterranean because of this stigma of returning back home. And this is a challenge we have and we need to face. The other issue that I would briefly would like to and highlight is coordination and partnership. Partnership is essential in this partnership in IOM. IOM Somalia and IOM globally, it's working over with over 20 Somali embassies and across the globe for return programs and also for rescue. And um, collaboration is also important at the very regional level because of the Somalia and having ethnic Somali communities in Kenya, in Ethiopia uh, and, and other countries, we are, we are definitely 
in front line, in coordination, but also coordination at the regional level and IGAD level, it's essential to make sure that our efforts are towards the implementation of the GCM. And especially, I would like to um, again highlight in rescue operation, we need to collaborate at capital level, we need to collaborate at embassy level. Um, last point is um, IOM and the UN Migration Network. It is more than ever needed today. We need to work together with you. We need, as, um, as government, we need also to enhance our collaboration with civil society. Uh, my co-panelist from um, Lebanon has highlighted how important that is. I always say that the civil society can reach where we can't and vice versa, we can reach maybe where the civil society cannot reach. So that is very important. And the UN Migration Network that, um, and I wish to commend IOM Somalia for leading successfully the um, UN Migration Network in um, Mogadishu coordinating um, all um, for all Somalia. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just highlight this. Human traffickers today are more, co are more coordinate, coordinating than us. They are reaching out to our youth faster than us through so many channels. They are outside the schools, they're outside the university. We are always the last one to receive the information. This is a challenge today. We need to make sure that we are coordinated and we need to believe that we are better than them. And the GCM is the only way out. GCM now and the implementation and full commitment is needed more than ever. And thank you for IOM and looking forward to May. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was a bit more than the time, but you were making such important points. I couldn't, couldn't stop you in the middle. Um, okay, so thank you very much for that. Very important points indeed. Um, Florian, can I now give you the opportunity for your concluding remarks? Thank you, Goshi, and um, I'll, I'll make it shorter then um, and catch up. Um, the first one, I, I just really um, want to echo in, in particular the representative of the, of the Holy See. I think this question of the right balance uh, between um, justified, perfectly justified policies to control borders, to control migration on the one side, and, uh, and providing protection for migrants is, is really critical. And, and what we observe often is that even well-meaning policies to uh, uh, um, to limit smuggling, for example, can have um, the unintended impact of actually pushing more and more migrants on ever more risky and dangerous migration routes. So some of these policies actually have the potential to aggravate the problem rather than to be in a solution in themselves. And, and linked to that is the second point is really about the preservation of the humanitarian space. That is something very concerning. It's, it's a space that has been shrinking in recent years that makes the work of organizations like the ICRC and the many members of the ICRC, uh, of the um, Red Crescent and Red Cross movement around the world more difficult uh, in, in some regions when uh, rescue, for example, is being criminalized, it is becoming very difficult um, to work. So this is really a call to preserve that space and to allow allow humanitarian organizations to to do life saving to do to provide life saving assistance to migrants in need um, and a third one is just uh, a bit of promotion what uh, uh, Laura Townhead has already mentioned next week on the 9th as part of the IMRF um, online dialogues um, we're co-organizing with uh, IOM's missing migrants project um, a dialogue that is dedicated to the topic of missing migrants missing solutions, question mark. And uh, we hope all of you who are interested in this topic um, to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florian. Um, yes, you did help us catch up a bit, but more importantly, you raised uh, very relevant um, points in, in concluding. And now, um, Ms. Arabian, may I call on you for your concluding remarks? Sure, I will be brief as well. So uh, I just want to say uh, in conclusion that as civil society, we would like to see concrete changes and further efforts done by states in protecting migrants, especially women and children. And as I mentioned, we would just like to stress the importance of cooperation and collaboration among the different actors for ensuring better protection, as no actor on its own can achieve the needed uh, results. 
Um, and as a network, we are looking forward to cooperating with UN agencies and states who are willing to uphold and enhance human rights and in particular rights of migrants. Finally, we would like to see states giving more attention to the objective eight of the GCM, as this has not been the case until today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Arabian, and thank you, um, distinguished panelists, um, excellencies, and distinguished participants for an extremely interesting discussion, but more importantly, for the very concrete actions that have been identified that require all of us to be well coordinated and to cooperate on solutions for upholding the rights of, of, of migrants, ensuring their dignity and, and safety, and most important of all, saving lives in line with objectives seven and eight of the GCM. Thank you and bye-bye. I'd like to thank you to DDG and uh, panelists for an excellent uh, panel that we had as a first one. Now we uh, slowly, and not but that slowly, actually quickly transiting to panel two, combat immigration, smuggling and trafficking in person, that uh, will be moderated by my friend and uh, colleague uh, Federico Soda. Federico, floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dayan. And uh, excellencies, distinguished uh, guests, uh, participants, panelists, uh, good uh, good morning and uh, good evening. It's an honor for me to moderate uh, this panel with uh, two very distinguished uh, speakers. We'll be talking about combating smuggling uh, and uh, trafficking. Um, we've touched on a lot of these issues uh, already in the uh, first uh, session. Uh, of course, uh, what we started to get into is uh, striking this balance between uh, uh, enabling uh, human mobility, uh, protecting the rights of uh, migrants and people on the move. And uh, now we'll, we're going to probably get into uh, a little bit also the criminality side and cracking down on the criminal elements uh, uh, involving smugglers uh, and traffickers. Uh, of course, all of this work is at the core of uh, IOM's uh, mandate and uh, activities on the ground, but also very much uh, through our participation of uh, different uh, international uh, fora, such as the Interagency Coordination um, uh, System uh, for Counter-Trafficking, the ICAT, the Global Action Plan Against Trafficking uh, in Persons, Alliance 8.7, and of course, all linked to the 2030 agenda as well. Uh, the global compacts uh, play a critical role in this, and we're going to get into a little bit more uh, this uh, this specific issue during this session. And of course, it's an issue uh, that is regularly uh, taken up and discussed at the various regional processes around the world. So uh, we're honored to uh, be uh, to remain a key partner in this uh, in this very important area of work. Uh, it's an area that uh, involves an extremely wide range of stakeholders, uh, not just uh, the obvious ones of governments and civil society, but also it's one that has uh, uh, increasingly interested the private sector, which is uh, a very very welcome. Uh, stakeholder to uh, to this uh, to this table and uh, to uh, an issue where uh, indeed uh, they have a very important uh, interest uh, and role in in contributing to uh, combating and eradicating uh, trafficking and uh, and smuggling now in relation to the uh, GCM the global compact on migration uh, there are two objectives that uh, really touch on, um, the issue uh, of, uh, of today's session, Objective 9, which, which calls for the strengthening of international cooperation among countries of origins, transit, and destination for transnational and effective responses to smuggling of migrants. Uh, and the key action to advance this objective is uh, legal pathways. So um, on one hand, uh, we have the uh, criminality and uh, some of the, um, let's say, law enforcement and security related concerns. 
And then on the other hand, uh, we have this need for greater legal pathways to uh, help mitigate uh, and reduce uh, the likelihood and the need for people to turn to um, smugglers and, 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 uh, and traffickers. The second uh, objective is objective 10. And uh, this objective uh, focuses uh, much more on the trafficking side, and it aims to prevent, combat, and eradicate trafficking in persons in the context of international mi migration. And here, uh, undocumented migrants are of particular uh, concern, uh, migrants in irregular situations, migrants without proper le legal status, uh, while legal status then does not in of itself guarantee protection, we know that people that don't have uh, proper legal status are much, much easier prey uh, for, for, for traffickers. So um, according to the latest uh, UNODC uh, data, 45% uh, of all identified victims of trafficking were trafficked across borders. So the international aspect is uh, extremely uh, relevant. Uh, the collaboration is uh, extremely uh, important. And uh, today's panel is gonna look at these challenges and exploring opportunities for facilitating pathways for safe, orderly and regular migration. Also regularization options to get people out of that uh, status uh, of limbo without uh, proper documents and uh, basically working towards achieving objectives nine and 10 of the global compact on uh, migration. Now, I am very happy to introduce uh, our two speakers. Um, the, our first speaker is Ms. Uh, Silke Albert, project coordinator for uh, UNODC. Uh, who is going to speak uh, about um, uh, UND, UNODC's work in the context of these uh, two objectives. And, uh, and then I'm very happy to also introduce Ms. Bandana uh, Patnak, uh, the International Coordinator of the Global Alliance Against, Traf Against Traffic in Women, GAATW. She is a CSO representative and I think that while she's going to acknowledge some of the progress that's been made, maybe uh, she can also uh, focus on some of the uh, remaining gaps. Uh, with this uh, introduction, uh, I thank you both very much, uh, panelists, and um, uh, over to you, uh, Ms. Albert. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you for convening this uh, open discussion on challenges and responses in what are core mandate areas for UNODC. Uh, apologies again that Ilias can't be with you, who you have probably expected, um, but needless to say, we are closely working with him and in the same team. Um, so as per the Global Compact on Migration itself, a lot of what we see in the agenda description of this session concerns a realization of the need for multifaceted, multi-stakeholder responses informed by dialogue, learning and coordination. You, you probably know that UNODC is the guardian of the fundamental international legal instrument on trafficking in persons and migrant smuggling. Uh, that is the Organized Crime Convention and the UN uh, uh, Trafficking and Smuggling Protocols, which over 20 years have become an internationally agreed basis for preventing these crimes, as imperfect as they may be, prosecuting perpetrators and protecting victims and promoting cooperation. These instruments, as they near universal ratification, remain incredibly relevant, with their effective implementation currently being reviewed and promoted through, through a process that will last until 2030. The protocols mature and the maturing use of the protocols is also reflected in the intergovernmental working groups on trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants, uh, treaty bodies that 
uh, have been created by the conventions uh, conference of the parties and which every year discuss emerging and critical sub issues related relating to the implementation of the protocols and producing forward looking recommendations to state to keep pace with emerging uh, best practice soft law so to say my organization, UN Odyssey, plays a key role not only as a UN entity with a clear and direct mandate on crime prevention and criminal justice, but also as one that prioritizes advancing the rule of law and protecting the rights of migrants in line with the international instruments of what we are the guardians of and incorporation of human rights considerations in our work as secretariat of uh, key UN processes and fora on, on organized crime. We have to remember that both trafficking and smuggling are profit-driven and that criminals treat trafficking victims and smuggled migrants as commodities and subject them to unimaginable suffering and risks. According to a, a study we have done um, from by the observatory, observatory sorry, on the smuggling of migrants, the demand for smuggling services is largely determined, and that doesn't come as a surprise from the discussions we have had, uh, by both limited availab availability of legal channels and the complexity and cost of legal migration, which some mig migrants simply cannot afford. Those who pay smugglers are not protected by state authorities. They put their lives and money into the hands of smugglers who often lock them into an exploitative cycle. UN Odyssey data shows that smuggled migrants are regularly subjected to extreme violence, torture, rape, and kidnapping at all stages of the migration cycle. Despite clearly related needs, on the one hand, the need of people to leave their home countries for a better future, and on the other hand, the need of countries of destination to address specific labor shortages, regular channels of migrating can be very restricted. This means that many migrants in need have no option but to cross borders by resorting to smuggling services. The added value of regularizing such migration flows for governments is that beyond preventing crime and criminal abuse and exploitation, they can better manage their borders and access to their territory. The striking death toll among migrants, many of which moving irregularly in 2021 and first month of 2022 is a reminder that states should not only combat the crime of migrant smuggling, but also offer legitimate alternatives to illegal services for people on the move. Ensuring that irregular movement is not categorically penalized is a common element to many key anti-trafficking and smuggling responses. Noting that criminalization of smuggling, smuggled migrants sadly continues to be a reality in many countries, I'd like to remind that the smuggling protocol, an international treaty that has been negotiated by member states and, and is being ratified by, by states so that they are parties and bound, says states that migrants shall not become liable to criminal prosecution for having been smuggled. And also uh, something that has not been as clearly stated in the trafficking in persons protocol, that, but that has emerged uh, as, 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 as best practice is uh, the principle of non-punishment of trafficking uh, victims for 
uh, illicit conduct as a result of their being trafficked uh, is, 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 this principle is in line with the, with the core purposes of the Trafficking in Persons Protocol, uh, saying that it, one of its aim is to protect and assist victims of trafficking with full respect for their human rights. Um, I check time. I may have to skip some of the lines that I that I still have. Uh, uh, you, can, you can go ahead, Miss Albert. Thank you, thank you. So, um, member states continue to demonstrate a grand, a great interest in applying this uh, non-punishment principle in practice, ensuring that penalties are not imposed on victims of uh, trafficking with the support of the international community. And, and, and maybe I can also mention that in 2020, ICAT has launched a policy brief, which not only summarizes the parameters of the non-punishment principle, uh, but also most importantly, also identifies a number of concrete areas where the non-punishment principle could be better implemented at national level. Also, humanitarian actors are often criminalized for rescuing migrants in distress on grounds of facilitation of illegal entry. And in fact, just before I, I, I joined uh, this panel discussion, I've been at a, at a debate at the European Parliament where European uh, parliamentarians um, could, uh, could, could, could join in with questions live. And, and of course, the question of, uh, of uh, criminal acts of NGOs that amount to smuggling and trafficking and how this is being, um, being um, uh, treated by the European uh, member states. Uh, so, it, well, it's, it's interesting um, because the, the smuggling protocol really does require uh, an illicit uh, financial or other material benefit. And we should not forget that, especially the, the migrant smuggling protocol, it is supplementing the organized crime convention. Uh, so this is where, this is to put things into perspective um, and not to punish humanitarian, uh, humanitarian uh, aid organizations. So uh, it, it, these are examples that uh, demonstrate that too frequently criminal justice action is misdirectly, misdirected and inadequately implemented at, at the harder but core targets to both of these issues. So organized criminal networks, especially their kingpins that perpetuate these, these practices and those responsible for aggravated or worst forms of migrant smuggling involving extreme abuse, <clears throat> sorry, extreme abuse and death of migrants and the illicit income generated by these, by these industries. Um, I think I would still come to an end here and then maybe some of the other issues I noted, uh, also examples of our work, uh, if, 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 if an interest, uh, could then be shared at a, at a later stage. And I'm looking forward to the next presentation very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, uh, for highlighting uh, some in, so many important issues, uh, the, the importance of legal pathways, the, 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 the relationship between irregular migration and high costs of, of legal migration. Uh, and of course, uh, the reminder of the international standard on the non-criminalization of uh, smuggled and trafficked persons. Let me now go over to uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Pat, uh, Pataniak. Um, you, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. And um, it's indeed a... Um, honor to be uh, here and to share the panel with Silke after uh, it's good to see you after such a long time even on screen. So um, um, I was asked to speak a little bit on the progress made on uh, 
these two uh, issues which have uh, attracted a lot of attention over the years. What we, at the outset, what we need to remember as we are going uh, to, towards IMRF, uh, and particularly in this session when we are looking at objective nine and 10, that uh, the ONTOC, the uh, Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, uh, is actually more than 20 years old now. So while we are reviewing the GCM, uh, looking back at four years, we actually need to look at these uh, in, as the convention and particularly these two instruments uh, for the progress that has been made over the last 20, more than 20 years. So um, I think it requires, I think the first panel was really sobering and gave us a very clear picture of the tragic things that are happening and uh, and the points that uh, the, the uh, that silke already mentioned need to be kept in mind so i think it needs to be it is important to reiterate to remind ourselves that certain rights are inalienable and apply to everyone regardless of their migration status. So under the smuggling of migrants protocol, state parties have agreed to ensure those, that those rights arising from human rights, refugee and humanitarian law are not compromised in any way in the implementation of measures to counter the smuggling of migrants. Uh, and in the, in, uh, the protocol also has some specific rights. Now, if those rights were being implemented, if those rights were being protected, we would not have heard what we heard in the first panel today. And the last two years actually have brought in an exceptional, um, exceptional challenges for everyone. And those challenges have not ended yet. And they have held a mirror to the kind of societies we are, what kind of internationalism and multilateralism we are practicing, and to what extent states are abiding by international protection frameworks. So millions of people have lost their jobs. Many countries have not been able to provide social support and security to their citizens while countries which were already experiencing political conflict have not reduced, new ones have joined the list. Borders have been closed and regular pathways for migration and asylum have been reduced. In other words, human security has reached an all time low. Applications for regularization have not been processed. Research carried out by Europol, Mixed Migration Center and UNODC show that smugglers and traffickers have started taking new, more dangerous routes and started charging higher fees. So all this has clearly increased the risk of aggravated forms of smuggling. Uh, in 2020, a formal mechanism for the review of the organized crime convention and the protocols there too was launched under which state parties to those instruments uh, will, over the course of the next decade, review their implementation at the national level and identify gaps and good practices. Uh, let me start with a few positive things uh, that have happened during this time. Most countries have actually included irregular migrants in health and other basic services and social assistance measures. Some have created firewalls to provide a clear boundary between law enforcement immigration and public services so that all migrants, irrespective of their migration status, could access healthcare, education, and other social services and justice without fear of detection, detention and deportation. Renewal and extension of residence and work permits have happened, uh, temporary though they are. Migrants, including irregular ones, have responded by taking up frontline jobs. On the minus side, however, we also know that states have refused to allow people in, externalization and militarization of borders, criminalization of migrants and their supporters have continued. 
if we just use our common sense, we will know that aggravated vulnerabilities, with aggravated vulnerabilities, people will take more risks and risks of aggravated smuggling is bound to increase. There's plenty of evidence to show that there is no real solution to the problem of smuggling other than increasing regular pathways and regularization. Doing a proper assessment of the labor market would be the first step towards that, rather than closing eyes to large chunks of the economy. And at the origin end, employment guarantee by states need to be ensured. If certain temporary positive steps could be taken by some states during this crisis, the question is, why can't those be done as long-term solutions? Uh, the second question that I was asked to um, respond to was that what are the important evidence gaps to be addressed to inform anti-trafficking efforts? Uh, I'll be brief here. Sitting where we are and looking at the bulk of researches that have been done over the last two decades on the issue of human trafficking, I don't think that there are any evidence gaps. There is no area of anti-trafficking that has not been researched now. A good body of evidence exists to show that a predominantly punitive approach is not working. That exploitation has become so endemic to so many work situations that rather than looking to assist victims and punish perpetrators, states actually need to take proactive steps to create and guarantee jobs and protect labor rights, to make decent work a norm rather than just an aspiration. There is also a need to look into the development paradigms that has prioritized profit over people. I don't have to remind this evening's audience about the rising inequality within and between countries. We all know about the vaccine apartheid. We also know who is making money, huge amounts of it during this pandemic. There are other social issues as discrimination and gender-based violence as well, just to name just the two to be addressed. So my answer would be that there is no lack of evidence that anti-trafficking initiatives are not being able to deal with the escalating degrees of vulnerabilities, abuses that people are facing, which is not to say that nothing has been done or no progress has been made. It's just that the problem is such that the progress that we have made is not matching up to it. A more technical answer would be that if we really want to primarily use the criminal justice approach, we have to be very astute. We can't keep on broadening the framework and call everything trafficking or modern slavery and then use a very narrow crime control approach. We need to look at anti-trafficking measures as tools to be used in exceptional situations for timely but limited purposes. And we need to combine other measures which fall outside the anti-trafficking framework. I think I would stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for highlighting uh, the links between uh, this panel and the previous panel and uh, also uh, for noting the, uh, the very profound impact that the uh, pandemic uh, has had on, uh, on migration and indeed on uh, the way that um, people are moving now and how smugglers um, have adapted. I think um, we can now maybe um, open uh, the floor for questions and comments. I would like to invite uh, the uh, all the participants uh, also uh, to consider uh, the question that um, our third uh, panelist um, would have um, helped us reflect on, which is uh, what support would assist uh, governments to cooperate with other governments to monitor irregular migration routes, uh, which can be exploited by traffickers uh, and smugglers. So how can we, uh, how can we, the other stakeholders, uh, support uh, governments 
in in uh, in monitoring uh, these high risk uh, routes in order to uh, respond to uh, to combat uh, and and uh, reduce the smuggling and trafficking along them. The the floor is open. Uh, dear Federico, there is actually already uh, two uh, requests for intervention. The first one is coming from Moldova. Sergei Rusu, Chief Prosecutor of Prosecutor Office of Committing Organized Crime and Special Cases. Please go ahead. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, dear Director General Mr. Vitorino, uh, thank you for your invitation to the IOM International Dialogue on Migration 2022. I consider the session of combating migrant smuggling and trafficking in person a very much needed one. It is honor for me to attend this session, and I am grateful to the other participants who are sharing the here the experience from which we all can learn. Since 2005, when the counter-trafficking law was adopted, the Moldova government has been doing considerable effort to prevent and combating trafficking in person. Each year, considerable progress is achieved against the recommendation provided by different international bodies in order to protect victims and hold criminals accountable. Please allow me now to share with you the latest best practices that Moldova has deployed in this field in 2019 and 2020. I will start with the specialization of judges in combating human trafficking and related crimes. Aiming to have this implemented, the Prosecutor General addressed the Superior Council of Magistrate, which agreed to examine the issues. Subsequently, since 20, 2020, Moldova has judges specialized in human trafficking and related crimes, such as forced labor, organization of illegal migration, trafficking of organs. Later, upon the request of the judges themselves, uh, this decision was, uh, of uh, the Council was amended, aiming and ensuring that a victim-centered approach is mainstreamed in the action of prosecutors in view of the extreme protection needs faced by victim of trafficking. The, uh, the second positive achievement that I would like to share is related to combating online sexual exploitation. Moldova developed a guide on international and national legal norms and instruments in the field of combating child abuse and sexual exploitation using the information and communication technologies. The guide imposes a unitary approach of cases on online sexual exploitation and describes the best practices in the field. It is mandatory for prosecutors and criminal investigation officers to follow the guide during their activity. Moreover, the guide has the merit of being developed in cooperation with the international NGO La Strada. Another key achievement in the uh, development on official approval of the guide to con conducting parallel financial investigation. The guide was uh, approved by the Prosecutor General's Order of 2019 and is a long-awaited instrument of mandatory nature to prosecutor and criminal investigation officers. The guide was developed with the IOM support. Despite uh, good results I have described so far, some key challenges for us still remain. The broad use of the internet and communication technologies, which open up to new venues for traffickers to exploit the victims, poses uh, continuous challenges uh, to legal frameworks, investigation, and uh, prosecutions. Increasing economical inequality between different social strata, between people from different regions of the same countries, as well as between citizens of countries of destination and origin. Social or economical inequalities continue to fuel the offer and the demand of trafficking. Specialized prosecutors will stay committed to fight the crime of trafficking in person in Moldova and will continue active cooperation with all national and international stakeholders to ensure not only prosecution, but also victim-centered approach and respect of the right of the victims. We consider the only strong partnership and dialogue at all levels will contribute to eradicate this phenomenon, which should be uh, one of the priorities for each country. This being said, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, the next, what we have uh, on our list is a representative of Argentina.
do we have them promoting the panelists? It's online. Yes. Sí. Bueno, me escucha. Sí, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Ah, gracias. Eh, Thank you. In, your, in its biannual report, the Secretary General uh, highlighted the progress in our country of the trafficking of persons and the protection assistance of victims. In fact, the Republic of Argentina has been working for many years in an active policy of fighting against migrant smuggling and human trafficking. It has a specific act incorporated into the penal code, which led to the generation of structures, areas, programs, and practices in the different spheres of the states at, at local, provincial, and national level. And on its hand, the migration law establishes the migration regulation for those people who have been victims of trafficking or uh, illicit uh, migrant smuggling, uh, sim simplifying and making the administration easier. From the joint work of the executive committee and the federal committee, on combating human trafficking and the protection and assistance of victims. Public policies are being implemented for access to jobs, um, housing, therapy, and reparation of victims within a biannual framework as that has been agreed in, at the different levels. This national plan 2022 includes 100 actions, assistance to victims, prosecution of bans and etc. One of the policies carried out in order to progress this objective has been the creation of regional offices of the national program of red to rescue and help of victims of trafficking. The strategic place is the border with the goal of preventing this crime and also to accompany and provide assistance, psychological, medical, and legal assistance to those victims up to the point in which the, they provide testimony to judges. And finally, and to conclude, I'd like to mention that Argentina proposed in the South American Conference of Migration, the creation of six uh, working networks, uh, of which I highlight the network against, or the, for the fight against trafficking, which whose goal is to create consensus on this topic in the South American region. Two meetings took place for this network, exchanging of best practices and progress amongst the parties, and they talked about uh, regulatory um, innovations, strengthening of information assistances, training, awareness raising, and uh, publication and protocol generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Castella. Now next should be uh, Venezuela, but I don't know, have some problem with the connection. Are they still online? Their audio uh, is not connecting to the conference properly. Okay, so can we get, get, get okay? Then can we go to a representative of Japan, please? Thank you, uh, Chief of the Mission in Libya, Mr. Federico, for giving me the floor and sharing sovereign experiences on the ground. I'm also grateful to the prominent speakers of the panel for your insightful inputs on challenges of migration governance. The threats posed to migrants by smuggling and trafficking are immense. They deprive migrants not only of their survival and livelihoods, but also of their dignity. The situation requires a holistic approach, putting people at the center and advancing the human security nexus, which can make coordinated efforts based on solidarity among international communities. As a concrete effort to address the situation, Japan has been working proactively in these fields in cooperation with international organizations on objectives 9 and 10. 
firstly, on objective nine, Japan, in cooperation with UNODC, has contributed to strengthening countermeasures against the smuggling of immigrants and migrants across the borders of the ASEAN member states. These include two established border liaison offices and enhanced communication mechanisms among the offices. In addition, the project also helps all relevant law enforcement authorities of each member state of ASEAN to work for making agreements on border control and enhance information exchange mechanisms. Secondly, on Objective 10, Japan has been active in providing relevant organizations with training and awareness raising against trafficking in persons, especially in ASEAN countries, through multiple organizations, such as JICA, UNAFE, UNODC, and UN Women. Moreover, Japan has long provided repatriation and reintegration support, including vocational services and legal and medical assistance to foreign victims of trafficking in persons identified in Japan through IOM. In 2021, approximately 142,000 US dollars were provided to IOM in this field. To conclude, Japan remains an active partner with the UN system, including IOM, to combat trafficking in persons. I thank you. Thank you, Japan. We have still three requests for interventions. Uh, we have Venezuela, we have Eritrea and Madagascar. Now I would like actually to check one more time, is Venezuela resolved the problem with the sound? No, no? not yet. Okay, can we again go to Eritrea, please? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, Director General of the IMM and uh, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, I would like to thank the panelists and uh, also welcome the convening of uh, this first session of international uh, dialogue on migration. Uh, we believe that the interrelated crimes of migrant smuggling and human trafficking continue to pose serious danger to millions around the world, especially in the Horn of Africa impede social economic progress, undermine the rule of law and the governance, and threaten regional security. The government of Eritrea is committed to fighting trafficking in person in all its manifestations. For the past decade, it has implemented a four-pronged strategy to combat eradicate trafficking in person and mitigate the impacts on victims. First is to intensify its efforts to achieve rapid, people-centered, and balanced social economic development in order to create opportunities for citizens to live and thrive in their own country. Second, deterring and combating trafficking in person. In this context, all relevant law enforcement bodies have been working with the needed coordination in combating trafficking. There is a cell within the Ministry of Justice to do that. Uh, Eritrea also uh, acceded to the convention, the, the Palermo Convention on Trafficking in Person, and uh, we have uh, uh, made some efforts to enhance our uh, legal, institutional, and technological capacity. We have also signed a comprehensive partnership agreement actually with the uh, UNODC to strengthen the crime prevention and criminal justice capacity, including the ability to combat transnational organized crimes. Third, supporting victim, victims of human trafficking and smuggling of migrants. Eritrea opposed any stigmatization of victims of human trafficking and provided them with all the possible assistance. Uh, for the strengthening regional and international cooperation, Eritrea view combating and eradicating transnational organized crimes, such as trafficking in person, is as an integral part of their, uh, its struggle for peace and security in the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea. Let me conclude. Eritrea also continues to advocate for in all international for us the, for uh, the importance of addressing and eradicating all causes of human trafficking, extreme poverty, global inequality, the vulnerability of irregular migrants, conflicts and warfare, wars, sexual exploitation, cheap labor, and organ piracy. Let me conclude uh, by saying that we have actively participated in the global compact on migration, and we do believe that the GCM. Uh, is um, 
a tool that was created or a platform that was created for uh, by member states to uh, foster cooperation at international level. And we believe that the IMRF will be an opportunity to learn from each other and re-energize our inter international cooperation to make migration safe, orderly, and regular. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eritrea. Now we'd like to give the floor to Madagascar. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. In terms of migration, Madagascar doesn't have a, a national migration policy, but we're still fully committed uh, in, in favor of a better government on the national level, on the regional level, on the local level. And now we're facing several um, challenges uh, when it comes to protecting uh, these migrants, especially during the health crisis. We faced several hurdles um, because we wanted to support some of our migrant workers uh, who were stuck in some countries where we don't have an embassy. So it was really difficult to, uh, to help these people. Uh, on top of the very low number of uh, embassies in Madagascar, we're also facing uh, the threat of human trafficking. So in this context, some other countries in the Indian Ocean are used by recruitment agencies as uh, relays for traffickers. So it's necessary to have uh, an enhanced uh, collaboration and cooperation in order to, to tackle this issue and in order to fight uh, human trafficking. So this is why Medical Sky is supporting any effort to uh, tackle uh, the traffic of migrants, forced labor, and to stop uh, forced recruitment and in order to have a fair uh, recruitment of workers in the framework of all the norms, the regional norms. So this is why we've just uh, released uh, a manual a guidelines for migrants and workers who will go uh, abroad to work. So we have a list of all the, the most important guidelines in order to raise awareness of all the uh, trafficking. Generally speaking, a better understanding of uh, trafficking and human trafficking and is still important. This is why we need to have a holistic approach of governance. So in order to have a good implementation of uh, the uh, global compact and to conclude, so we would like to reiterate our uh, support to uh, the migration in compliance with human rights. And this is why we need to have a good coordination on the regional level and on the international level. And this is why we need to have a uh, uh, good and efficient uh, tools, like, for example, uh, exchange of data and a, a better uh, follow-up on trafficking. But we need able to uh, uh, build our capacities. And thank you for your attention. Many thank you, Madam Scar. I think we resolve the issue with uh, Venezuela. Now I would like to give the floor to Bolivian Republic of Venezuela, Director General of Consular Relations, Marco Magillanes. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? I'm loud and clear. Great. I apologize for the technical difficulties we had the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Thanks the opportunity to participate in this second panel of today, talking about the combating migrant smuggling and trafficking in persons. I want to in name of the President of the Republic, I want to thank all of you for this invitation and a warm salutation 
for the Director General of the IOM. Dialogue spaces such as these are extremely important, given that the pandemic has affected the vulnerabilities of the people in movement. The traffickers seem to be also evolving the techniques, and we cannot talk about these issues if we ignore the root causes that force people to migrate. We need to look at how much this is the result of actions taken by countries that are overlooking the country's sovereignty. The migration policies are also criminalizing the migrants and the criminal strategies of these trafficants should also be analyzed. The national state participates in a voluntary fashion to achieve a safe, orderly and regular migration. And the GCM objective nine and 10, which guides our work on this topic. We're also part of the United Nations Convention Against Organized Criminality and our commitment to this is obvious. We have also created a task force that works very hard dealing with survivors of trafficking and of terrorism. The President Nicolas Maduro has also created a plan against the trafficking of people from 2021 and 2025. We want to highlight the Venezuelan support to the non-criminalization of victims. And we have created a roadmap, a roadmap for this end. And you can find it on the website of our office. To conclude, the dividing lines between migrant smuggling and people trafficking is very thin. On the one hand, the migrant smugglers can be victims of people trafficking. This should be understood, but we need to work together with the countries of origin, transit and destination to exchange information about the networks that work on these criminal issues. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Venezuela. The, the list of uh, countries that, or participants that express interest for intervention exhausted, and I would like to give the floor back to Mr. Federico Soda. Please, Federico. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, I'd like to maybe give the opportunity to uh, our panelists uh, for any uh, final remarks that uh, they may have or, or comments uh, on the interventions that have been made. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, with uh, you, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Patanik. Thank you. Um, as we heard from uh, several representatives, uh, indeed, a lot of work has been done by states. And I remember, you know, the biannual conference of state parties that happens countries after countries do talk about the steps that they have taken so what today and and as we all know uh, the un transnational organized crime convention is what is one of the most widely ratified instruments so and there is i think it would be very hard to point out any single country which doesn't have or hasn't done anything on uh, uh, this particular thing. So a lot of uh, efforts have been made, uh, different mechanisms and all those, there is no lack of that. So the question today in front of us is why the, we are still uh, at this thing. So therefore, so wh why, why, are in, why are we in such a situation that we're still thinking that we haven't reached the goals or haven't reached the human rights goals, if you like. Um, 
So therefore, if we want to use anti-trafficking language, then I think there is need to be more focused on prevention and prevention not in the way that we have been doing for so many years, not as awareness generation, not as telling people. I think people do have a lot of knowledge of what is going on. So therefore, prevention in the sense of uh, increasing human security and um, creating jobs, addressing discriminatory practices in our society and in our other thing. So I think those are the steps that would actually aid the criminal justice approach. Criminal justice approach alone is not going to be able to solve the problem because the problem is not only in the arena of uh, crime. We, we called it a crime, looked at this as a kind of, you know, an extreme form of vulnerability, extreme form of human rights violation, and that has its place. So the other side of the work, other groups of people or other departments or other uh, sort of bodies within the states would have to take up. I think that would, that's what I would like to say. Thank you very much. Ms. Albert, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would, of course, echo what uh, Bandana said. And I also see it as a, as, as, a, as a great sign, actually, that there are so many states that, that really wish to report what they've done. And, and, and no doubt, a lot of good work has been done. And, and awareness has increased among states um, of what it needs to be done, even though probably in the in the daily struggle, that's a, um, a challenge to implement. I mean, what 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 I take from that also for for ourselves um, in looking at things, uh, I'd be happy if we see also among among us the different uh, mandates a strengthened collaboration and, and, and UNODC, for example, is a, a member of and coordinator of ICAT, um, Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking in Persons, with, with, with members that have all sorts of different mandates. And, and also the, we are member of the UN Migration Network. And, and, and I think it would be great also if we could start strengthening collaboration between these groups um, to, to, to strengthen the efforts and to really take the best of and the strongest part of the, make the most of the mandates that exist um, in the international uh, area community so that we meaningfully um, can support steps of member states uh, in, in, in addressing uh, trafficking and smuggling and, and, and really going beyond a criminal justice angle uh, to these things. I call them crimes and they are crimes. And at the same time, um, we, we, we do know very much and we see that through these groups uh, that, that, that one perspective on things is on these issues is really not enough. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much uh, to uh, to both of you, and uh, indeed, uh, thank you very much to all of the uh, participants that uh, intervened. Uh, but also, uh, a lot of a lot of the comments uh, in the chat by uh, by other uh, by other participants and governments that uh, did not take the floor. Uh, indeed, uh, what is clear uh, is uh, how complicated this is, and uh, we've talked about maybe two faces uh, of the issue, uh, the criminal and the, and the rights one, but uh, probably there are uh, several more. Uh, certainly the collaboration uh, between uh, the agencies can be strengthened. I think this idea of uh, strengthening the work of the ICAT uh, and the uh, migration network is uh, is is a very interesting one, um, and uh, we have to basically uh, facilitate uh, the uh, possibility 
of working in a whole of society, whole of government uh, kind of way on these uh, on these issues. I mean, uh, from the criminal perspective, we're talking about organized uh, organized crime and uh, a very very lucrative uh, activity along uh, some of the corridors. So um, there is no way that uh, we can simply tackle uh, these issues and address uh, address some of the uh, some of the problems uh, uh, simply with uh, a, a singular uh, approach. Um, once again, uh, thanks to um, uh, everybody who intervened. Thanks uh, to everybody that has been uh, participating uh, and attending uh, this session. We have uh, several hundred uh, participants online still, so uh, it's, it's uh, very, very nice to have you with us. And uh, thanks again. I wish you all a good afternoon or evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.